Hello class. So this is the first video on section 5.2. Now, what we're gonna do in this section is we're gonna reintroduce the symbol for the integral. So in the previous chapter, in section 4.9, we introduced the symbol for an indefinite integral. Right? That indefinite integral represented all antiderivatives of a function on some interval. Now here we're gonna reintroduce that notation, but instead we're gonna call it a definite integral. Now, what is this definite integral going to be calculating? Well, it will be calculating the net area bounded by a function. Okay. So I'll talk about this more in a moment, but just based on this, that, in this thing that I said, we need to find a way to define what net area is. Okay. So that's what we're going to talk about in this section. So what is net area? Now, notice that in all the previous examples we're doing in 5.1, when we were where we were approximating area using rectangles, our function was always positive. Right? So kind of like in this scenario here, we always had a positive function. So when it came for us to approximate the area, it was very clear what area we were approximating. In this case, if we're approximating the area bounded by a function f and bounded below by the x-axis, well, we know we're approximating that region in green. So that's, that's what we've been doing in this previous examples in section 5.1. Now what I wanna do in this section is make things a little bit more general. What if we have a situation like in two here where a function is not positive on the whole interval, but it at some point becomes negative. So something like this. If you see in this case, we have a function from the interval a to b. This function is still, let's call it g of x. And now we have two things going on, right? We have a part of the area that's above the x-axis. So, so this part here, from A to that red to, let's call it uh, C here. But then we see that from C from B, our function is below the x-axis. Now there is still some area bounded there, and that's that part that I, that I shaded in blue. Right? So it's clear what area we're finding where, when we're be between A and C. It's clear that we're finding this area, we're approximating this area. So what we want to do when our function is negative is we still find the area bounded by f and the x-axis. The only difference is that when f is negative, now f becomes a lower bound. Now it's found in the region above, below instead of above. But in terms of finding the area, it's the same thing. So what does that mean for us? Now, instead of saying that I want the, to find the area or approximate the area bounded by above by f and below by the x-axis, I'm just gonna say more generally, I wanna find the area bounded by f, meaning that f can be, could be bounding the region either above the x-axis, okay, so like here, or below the x-axis, like here. But in terms of finding the area, it should be the same thing. Because for example, suppose I draw I have two triangles, they're the same triangle. I draw one above the x-axis in blue and one below the x-axis in orange. It doesn't matter where we drew the triangle, it has the same area. If the area is, one, is I don't know, like four, if the area of this is four, then it doesn't matter that it's below the x-axis, the area is still four. So the same thing is gonna happen, is gonna happen with area below the x-axis. This part here, even though it's below the x-axis, I can still give it a value, right? Because it's still area, it's positive, I can find it. Okay? And it doesn't matter that it's below the x-axis. So that's basically the idea. We can now make things more general and approximate area not of functions not only above the x-axis, but also below the x-axis. Now, the only thing that's gonna be different is even though area is positive by definition, whatever is below the x-axis, we're gonna take the negative of it. Okay, so we're gonna find the area between C and B, right? so this area here, let's say it's seven, well, because it's below the x-axis, we're gonna say it's negative seven, so we're gonna, we're gonna take the negative of the area. But that's the idea. Okay. So let's go ahead and do an example. We select Riemann sum to approximate the area bounded by f of x equals one minus x squared and the x-axis on the interval zero to four using six subintervals. Now notice here, I'm already using this new, this new terminology. I use area bounded by f instead of saying 
the area bounded above by f and below by the x-axis, because now I'm considering the fact that f could be positive or negative on my interval. Now, I mentioned that, and, and we saw in the previous video, that we don't really need to draw a graph of this. We can just do it algebraically. But I did go ahead and draw a quick graph. So 1 minus x squared is just a downward opening parabola that's shifted up by 1. Okay, so it looks something like this. Okay, so for this part, just so you see what's going on, I will be drawing the, the rectangles again. So let's first start what, like we always do. We need to find the change in x or the length of each subinterval. So again, what's this? You subtract the endpoints, divide by the number of subintervals, we get two thirds. So if we go to our picture, what is this going to look like? Well, we're going to go starting at zero. I'm going to add two thirds to come here. Then I add two thirds again. So two thirds plus two thirds is four thirds. So that's, um, let's see, or would that be four thirds is bigger than one, but less than two, somewhere here, four thirds. Then I add two thirds again. I'm at six thirds, right, which is two. So this I should have drawn a little bit back. So six thirds, which is two plus two thirds, that's eight thirds, so somewhere here, plus two thirds, that's 10 thirds, somewhere here, then plus two thirds, that's uh, 12 thirds, which is four. Okay. So now we have as our sub intervals. So we have zero to two thirds, two thirds to four thirds, four thirds to two, two to eight thirds, eight thirds to 10 thirds, and 10 thirds to four. And they all have length change in X. Now, we're doing a left endpoint approximation. A left endpoint, or left Freeman sum each means left endpoint approximation. So let's go ahead and draw the rectangles. So for the first rectangle, I'm doing a left endpoint, so that would be zero. So that would be the height. All right, so that's the first rectangle. Now for the second rectangle, again, I'm using a left endpoint. So this, this would be the height here, the function evaluated at the left endpoint, and it looks like that. Now for the next subinterval, again, I'm using the left endpoint. So now I'm going down here. So how do you draw your rectangle? Well, the same, but you draw it below the x-axis. Okay, so like that. Now for the next left endpoint, come all the way down here. And notice that the height is still given by the function value. But when the function value is negative, our rectangle just goes the other way. So this is this rectangle for 8 thirds. This rectangle, 10 thirds, which is the last one. We have this rectangle. So what is it, the area that we're approximating? Well, we know what it is. And here, I'm going to draw it in green. So for the first subinterval, we're getting more than we should. Same for the second subinterval. Now here, we're getting less than the area. right? And now the rectangles are below the x-axis because the functions are below the x-axis. Right, so notice that on, when the rectangles are below the x-axis, I'm getting less than the, than the total area because the total area should also include this part here. Right? If I wanted to, to find the, area, the whole area bounded by the function and, and the x-axis. So I'm, I'm missing a lot of it, but that's fine. We know this is just an approximation. So that's what the picture looks like. Now we can just go ahead and do this algebraically and find what it is. So a sub l for left Riemann approximation. So it's going to be changing x, always for the for the length of the rectangle. So two thirds times f of the first left endpoint, which is zero. So we start at zero plus two thirds f oops times 
So two thirds times f of zero plus changing x, right? Remember, we always use that changing x plus two thirds times f of four thirds plus two thirds times f in. Again, I just keep adding changing x. Uh, so this would be six thirds, which is two plus two thirds times f of, again, f changing x, that would be eight thirds. Now we have one, two, three, four so far, uh, five, we need one more. So one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, so the last one plus two thirds f of 10 thirds. And remember, how do you know how many terms in the sum you need? Well, just take how many terms as the number of subintervals. And this is the area approximation. Of course, we could go ahead and find a number. Which we would just plug these into the function. Right? The function was 1 minus x squared. So let's do a couple. Uh, let's use some approximation. So let's do that equals. So f of 0 was 1. So 2 thirds times 1 plus 2 thirds times f of 2 thirds. So 1 minus 2 thirds squared. That's 4 minus 9. So we get. 1 minus uh, 4 minus 9, uh, which is 5 ninths. So 5 ninths plus 2 thirds times f of 4 thirds. That's 16 divided by 3, 5 by 9. Now, so we get 9 over 9, 1 minus 4 thirds squared, 16 divided by 9. And now you see we start to get to the negative rectangles, right, where the height is negative. Right, so what would this be? Uh, 9 minus 16, that's negative 7 ninths. Negative 7 ninths. So that corresponds to this height here, right, negative 7 ninths. And you keep going. So let's finish up real quick. So plus 2 thirds, 9 over 9 minus 64 over 9, so for the next one, that's negative 55, no, negative, yeah, negative 55 ninths. Negative 55 ninths plus 2 thirds, now for the next one is 8 thirds, so that's 9 over 9 minus 60, oh, I skipped 36, sorry. So 39 minus 36 is uh, 25 nines. So 25 nines, the next one we already did, that's negative 55 nines. And for the last one, nine minus 100, that's negative 91. So negative 91 nines. Now see here, as I mentioned, we're adding the negative of the areas. Right? So for example, for this part here, this area, so we know area is positive, but as I mentioned, when the triangle, when the rectangle is below the x-axis, we're gonna take the negative of it, right? which comes down naturally because the function is negative. So in the sum, what are we doing? We're taking, for this first negative rectangle, we're taking that area and making it negative, right? Adding a negative in front which that's why we have a negative seven ninths there. In the end, we add all of these. Some numbers are positive, some numbers are negative, and we get an answer. This answer here is what we call net area. An approximation, of course, because we're approximating. So in terms for us algebraically, uh, or even graphically, what are we doing? We're doing the same thing we did in the other, in the uh, in the previous video. The height is still given by the function value. If it's negative, all that means is that our triangle is below the x-axis. Right? So we add the negative of the area. Again, area is always positive, but in our sum, we add the negative of the area. Right. So so the negative always shows up there because the function is negative. So that but that's how you want to think of it. And that's what net area is. So what's a net area? So given a function r, bounded, by, again, I'm just going to say bounded by a continuous function f and the x-axis on the interval a, b, the net area, well, is the sum of the area above the x-axis minus the area below the x-axis. So going back to the to a picture I drew before, and if 
we have a function that in some region it's above, some region it's below, then we're going from A to B. Okay. So what would be the net, the net area? Well, you would add this area here, the positive one, let's call it R1. You would find the area of R2. R2, and that area then would be just the sum of these. So net area would be, well, R1 is positive, and then since R2 is negative, again, as we saw in the previous example, you add the negative of the area. Just as we were doing with the rectangles here. Whenever the rectangle was below, there was a negative sign in the, in the approximation, meaning that we were adding the negative of the area, or as you can see it in this picture. And that's what net area is. Again, computationally, you calculate it the same way. Okay, just use, even if it's a left Riemann sum, let's go ahead and multiply the length of the rectangles with the height, which is always given by the function value, whether it's above or below, you don't have to do anything else. Graphically, what's going on is what I said. If the area is above the x-axis, it's positive. If the area is below the x-axis, you make it negative and you add them together. That's net area. 